My name is Sarah Williams, granddaughter of Bobby Hammonds. My grandfather instilled in me and all of his family a love of history and knowing your family roots. He took me and all of his grandchildren on trips every summer to learn about the history of Texas. I think I've seen every museum in the state. He put in years of work researching his family history and left us his findings as well as personal recollections of his own life. His many loving family members are recorded now reading his history and recollections in his own words. William Calvin and Martha Emmeline Vaughn incidents in their lives. William Calvin Cap Bond was born May 23, 1878 in Rutherford County, Tennessee to Solomon Bond Jr. He lived from 1842 to 1917. Mary Bond, Ward Bond, 1847 to 1908. Mary was supposed to be three-fourths Cherokee. Martha Emmeline Emma Owens was born February 6, 1884 in Rutherford County, Tennessee to James H. Owens, 1837-1907, and Mary Jane Arnold, 1841-1913. Cap and Emma were married March 5, 1899 in Bedford County, Tennessee by Parson Sam Alsop. Emma was the youngest of 13 children. According to Cap, his parents and all three of their siblings decided to go to New Mexico and homestead. The 1820 Cash Act and 1862 Homestead Act allowed persons at least 21 years of age and the head of a household to make applications with five years residence, improvements and cultivations, and a $15 fee to receive a deed to as much as 160 acres of land. They left Tennessee in three or four covered wagons, not sure if they used horses, mules, or oxen, crossed the Oklahoma Territory to Debaca County. Fort Sumner is the county seat, New Mexico. Fanny's first child was born in New Mexico in 1906 as per the 1910 U.S. Census. Camp stated that he had sufficient Indian blood to qualify for land in Oklahoma, but that you could buy land for about what the filing fees were. He also stated that he could walk a short distance from the wagons and kill deer and turkey. They lived in dugouts and used cow chips and cat claw roots for heating and cooking while in New Mexico. Camp's mother, Mary, may have died in New Mexico in 1908. We could find no record of her death or place of burial. Some of the Bond researchers show her buried in Tennessee, but no exact location. There was, a, there was train service to Fort Sumner during the time they lived there, so she may have returned to Tennessee. They received title to their land in 1911. Solomon Jr., 160 acres on February 13, 1911. Solomon Bond, III, Dick, 160 acres on March 9, 1911. And James W. Ferguson, 77.28 acres, one labor, on July 10, 1911. Their land was southeast of Fort Sumner, about two or three miles south of present U.S. Highway 84, about three miles east of Arroyo Taben, or Taben Creek, and northeast of Billy the Kid's grave. Records do not show details of the, of the homesteading process, only the deed transfer. Cap's name does not show up in the records, such as the deed transfer, so either he did not apply or did not live up to the homestead agreement. I might note here that the records show that Emma and her two young sons arrived in Gainesville, Cook County, Texas, on September 7, 1906, after a two-day train trip from Tennessee. It is possible she did not go to New Mexico. The only relatives we could find in the Marysville, Mossville, Fish Creek area of Cook County were Cap's distant cousins on the Ward side of his family. All of the Bonds either lived with or close by the Wards on the 1910 census. Cap and Emma kept returning here through the mid-1930s to live and to work. To complicate things further, Cap and Emma's third child, Leona, was born on July 12, 1909, which means she was probably conceived in October of 1908. Leona died on July 23, 1910, after falling from the bed and hitting her head. In 1911, Cap and Emma were still living in Cook County, and daughter Lena was born there on March 23, 1911. Their youngest son, William Columbus Jack, was born on December 27, 1915, in Coryell County.
Cab and Emma must have moved back and forth between Coriel and Cook counties, and even as far as Corpus Christi, picking cotton. In 1927, they were sharing sharecropping land north of Thalia, Ford County, Texas, belonging to Ernest Grimsley, a son of one of Cap Cook's arm, county cousins. By late fall of 1927, they were living in Cook County, where Lena was attending Fish Creek School. By December of 1928, they were living back in the Thalia area. Cap farmed north of Thalia again for a short t- time, then moved south of Thalia. At the end of the school year in May 1929, Lena married O.C. Hammonds, who also lived south of Thalia. The 1930 census showed Cap and Emma living south of Thalia. Ed, 30 years, and Jack, 14, were living with them. Cap and Ed, single, were shown as farm laborers. They lived in Divine Medina County, Texas, for two years in the mid-1930s. Ed and Jack were still at home. O.C. and Lena lived for four miles northwest of Divine on 10 acres of irrigated vegetable land his father had purchased and given to him. All of them moved to Gatesville in the summer of 1937, where O.C. and Lena remained several months before returning to Thalia. The 1940 census showed Cap, Emma, and Ed living with O.C. and Lena south of Thalia. Jack had joined the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1936 while they lived in Divine and the U.S. Air Force in 1941 prior to Pearl Harbor. After 1943, and for the remainder of their lives, they lived mostly in the Gatesville area with some stints with O.C. and Lena in the Thalia area. They both died in the Gatesville area, Emma on November 30, 1956, at the age of 72, and Cap on December 26, 1960, at the age of 82. Both are buried in the Greenbrier Cemetery, a few miles east of Gatesville in the South Mountain area. There is no record that Cap ever returned to Tennessee after going to New Mexico. Emma and her sister Ida, who lived near Coriel County in Morgan, Bosque County, Texas, returned to Tennessee to visit in about 1950 on public transportation after an absence of 44 years. This is the only record of her return. These are recollections that Daddy wrote down. I'll just start in reading. He says, I will jot down some things that are recorded, family stories, my past memories, and other information that might be more interesting to our immediate family. For the sake of brevity, I will use first names rather than the names we used. Being the oldest grandson on both sides of the family, I spent a lot of time with my father, O.C., and grandfather, Cap Bond. By the time I was three or four years old, I was attending dice and poker games, enjoying homebrew and many other bad habits with O.C. I lived with Cap and Emma, maternal grandparents, so much during my early years that they were probably my preferred family. During these years, they either lived with us or close by. Emma was the youngest of a large family, got married at barely 15 years of age, and left Tennessee and her family with two young boys, never to see most of her family again. This must have been awfully hard on her. She was still a most generous and caring person. When food was short, the grandkids got it. On hot summer days, she would let me walk in her shadow. After she started receiving her monthly old age pension check, she would give some to not only grandkids, but also to neighborhood kids. Cap was an adventurous soul. He loved to hunt, fish, tell stories about things like the trip homestead in New Mexico. He was not too fond of boring labor, but he was not a big spender. I recall when he was in his early 60s, he was afraid he would die before age 65, qualifying for Texas old age pension plan. He never owned an automobile, to my knowledge. He relied on his son, Ed, and others for transport. Sometime around 1920, Cap bought 80 acres in South Mountain in Coriel County by trading 
in his saddle horse. He also recounted that he had to cut down trees to make an entrance road. I do not recall his disposition of it. He has asked in his later years why he left Tennessee, and he laughed and recalled that he might have been run out. He was a big kidder, and hopefully he was just kidding. Joyce Vaughn mentioned that they took bananas to Emma in the mental facility and how she liked them. This reminded me that when we lived in Mossville in Cook County in 1932 until March 1933, a vendor came by and O.C. traded him a shoat, which is a half-grown hog, for a stalk of bananas. Between Emma, Lena, and us kids, they didn't last long. These vendors sold all kinds of small merchandise, particularly to women. Some even sold insurance. They were called hucksters or peddlers. Emma's father in Tennessee was listed as a huckster on the U.S. Census. In Mossville, O.C., Ed, Jack, and possibly Cap did farm work for a neighbor, which might have been a relative of Cap's. They received a dollar per load for harvesting corn and milo. A load was a field horse-drawn wagon. They used a knife to cut off the milo heads. The milo then was taller, and we called it maize. The corn was harvested in late summer or fall after the stalk and the ears had died and dried out. The ears were usually shucked, and the corn fed, fed on the cob to the animals. One place Cap and Emma lived south of Thalia in the early 1930s had wooden floors and no screen door. Grasshoppers would get on the dresser where Emma kept her chewing tobacco. She picked up the chewing habit while working on the tobacco fields of Tennessee before insecticides were available. Kids were used to take two growing tobacco leaves and squash the bugs between them. To sweep her wooden floors without a broom, she would use a broom weed with a string to hold it together. Smaller weeds also became handy when toilet paper was not available. Catalogs and magazines were common commodities in the outdoor toilets when you could not afford store-bought paper. O.C. and Cap had itchy feet, so we moved often. At the height of the Great Depression, 1936, found us all in Divine, which is 35 miles south of San Antonio. Cap and Emma lived in town. I stayed with them during my first grade in 1936 to 37. With two new pairs of overalls and shirts and a pair of new shoes, I was feeling pretty important. Emma's dresser and flat irons, no electricity, were used to press them. A neighbor's 10-year-old son enrolled me in school the first day. Ed and Jack had jobs, but I don't remember cap working. I recall eating raccoon and a possum during that time. They were a little greasy. One Friday after school, Emma had saved me the sugar to eat with my biscuit, nothing else. She and Cap had eaten salt with theirs. The next day on the trip to O.C. and Lena's, four miles northwest of Divine, in Ed's truck that only had a windshield and flat bed, Emma became weak and sick from hunger. O.C. and Lena seemed to have more to eat as they did vegetable farming on 10 acres with a three-room house given to O.C. by his father. I do recall when we first moved there, the last tenant had left some black-eyed peas in the field. Some of the peas contained worms. By putting the shelled peas in a pan of water, the worms would float to the top where they could be removed before the peas were cooked. Different entrepreneurs would grind your corn into meal and make syrup from your sugar cane for one half of the finished product. With the warm temperature and the flood irrigation from Medina Lake, two or three fast maturing crops could be grown annually. I do recall one incident I had with Uncle Jack. Jack was 20 years old and liked to look nice, so one afternoon he gave me a nickel to buy him a can of shoe polish. Being a brilliant six-year-old, I observed another kid eating a new candy called Bit of Honey. You could take a bite and then stretch it back to its original size. I deducted that with just one bar, I would never run out of candy. Jack did not agree and for some reason was a little upset that I returned with candy rather than shoe polish. Rooster fighting in Divine and surrounding areas was one of O.C.'s favorite pastimes, even though it was unlawful. I did notice that the adults spent a lot of time looking for the authorities. 
After being away from Thalia for over a year, unsuccessful financially, and tired of vegetable farming, O.C. rented out the farm in August 1937 for a Model A Ford sedan, a four-wheel trailer, and some cash. We headed for Gatesville, one of Cap's favorite places. With the weight of two families' belongings in the trailer, the Model A was a little underpowered. The hills east of Gatesville proved more than the car could achieve. Cap, the women, and I would get out of the car on the rural uphill grades, put rocks under the rear tires, and then push. We always made it. The approximately six months we resided in Gatesville, we lived at three houses, and I attended several schools. While attending the Gatesville schools, I would walk to the local domino hall after class and meet O.C. He officed there, thinking he could feed a family on his winnings, I assume. I discontinued my schooling before Christmas, but I did have enough ambition to stand out in the cold each morning and wave at the school bus as it passed. Another incident I recall while living in Gatesville area was Cap leaving the cotton field about mid-morning to go hunt squirrels while leaving the rest of us, including the women, trying to earn some money. He probably disliked the capitalist system and would have been a great socialist. After leaving Gatesville and several moves in the Thalia area, we were living in the town of Thalia near Cap and Emma by the fall of 1943. O.C. was staying in North Fort Worth with his sister and her husband a few blocks west of the stockyards and the new Isis movie theater. O.C. worked for Consolidated Volte Aircraft Corp., now Lockheed, building fighter planes. I was 13 and could drive, so while Emma attended to the younger kids, Lena and the rest of us kids pulled cotton. In November, we moved to the White Settlement area near Liberator, village to join OC. The White Settlement schools could not accommodate all the new move-ins, so we were bused to Fort Worth schools. I hadn't attended school all year and decided to stay free until after Christmas. When I did report, the counselor advised me there was no way I could pass that year. Having that problem out of the way, I caught a Fort Worth City bus, went uptown, and took in a movie. There was always next year. While in White Settlement, I delivered newspapers, shined shoes, and delivered groceries for people without cars in an apple box mounted on two wheels. Building airplanes took a lot less sweat and paid considerably more than farm work. With three hours of overtime lots of days, we were doing good. O.C. could not take prosperity, though, and developed his first heart attack at the age of 37, so it was back to Thalia in February of 1944. Cap and Emma had moved back to Gatesville in 1943 when we moved to White Settlement. They stayed with us some after that, but not for long lengths of time. Alva's son, Charles Bond, lived with Cap and Emma in Gatesville during his teen years after the early deaths of Alva and Charles's mother, Ruby. Upon Charles' return from the military, he and his wife Joyce looked after Cap and Emma until their deaths. In 1941, while living near us in Thalia, Emma became nervous and began her mental loss. A few years later, she was in and out of the Texas Mental Hospital several times before her death at one in Kerrville in 1956. Cap ended his life with Alzheimer's in the mental hospital in Austin in 1960. My other grandfather, Bill Hammonds, was the exact opposite of Cap. Bill was born in Limestone County, east of Waco, shortly after his family's arrival from Kentucky. He and Cap both shared 1878 as their birthdays. Bill got married to a local girl in 1898 and Cap in 1899 to a local girl in Tennessee. Bill's wife, Jessie, who was my grandmother, died during the flu epidemic in 1919. While Cap left Tennessee for homesteading in New Mexico, Bill and his family were farming, buying land, and increasing his wealth on the rolling plains of West Texas. His older brother, and later his younger brother, owned a considerable amount of land by the 1930s, 
His brothers continued to prosper during the Great Depression. However, Bill's four sons helped in depleting his wealth. Bill worked until his death in 1948. His land holdings had diminished to a home on 160 acres. Even during the 1930s, most people that wanted jobs could find one. The pay for farm work was a dollar to a dollar fifty per day, which was from sun up to sundown, about fourteen hours during the summer. There were a lot of federal programs that were supposed to help alleviate the effects of the economic downturn. They probably helped some, but the supplying of armaments to Europeans under the Lend Lease program in the latter nineteen thirties put the U.S. workforce to doing manufacturing, etc. With the new demand for employees in town, farm labor requirements afforded us kids a chance to work. We started gathering cotton when we were about school age, but in 1941, at age 11, I got my first day job. It paid $2 per day, and a day became only 12 hours. World War II was good economically, because it gave us employment and higher wages. However, some people suffered from the rationing of such things as sugar, meat, automobile tires, etc. With a large family such as ours, we had more rationing coupons than cash. One of the federal programs was free and clothing material which could be recognized at once where it originated. I always felt sorry for my sisters. Most of, the man, most of the men standing in line for the handouts were smoking and a lot of them had booze at home. Very few looked sickly. The summer that I was 12, Lucy got me a job with him working for a grain combine crew. We started harvesting wheat in Thea, Ford County area, and as the wheat matured, we harvested all the way to northwest Kansas on a slow tractor, about 10 miles per hour pulling a combine. I followed this pattern of work every year, even in 1949 after I graduated from high school, getting as far as Colorado and Nebraska some years. When we returned to Thea in 1944 from the airplane building fiasco and White Settlement, we lived in rented houses in the city of Thea until 1947. Upon our return, I worked for various farmers, went on wheat harvest, hoed, and pulled cotton. I did start back to school in the fall of 1944 and completed the 9th and 10th grades. After drinking beer all day and consuming too much food, O.C. conjured up another heart attack in 1946, so I got to skip another year of school in 1946 and 7. In addition to the usual labor, I used our older flatbed truck hauling grain, cotton, and cotton seed during the fall and winter, watermelons in summer as far as Amarillo, and sand out of Pease River to local customers anytime. After driving the truck a year or so without a driver's license, the county judge approved of me getting the license at 15 years of age, but I ran into a streak of bad luck. My uncle's car that we borrowed to take the test ran over the back post of the parallel parking space. The highway patrolman discontinued the test and asked me to take him back to the courthouse. After a few more years of driving, most of it in the truck, some of it with a load in another state, I passed the test at 18 years of age. In the spring of 1947, we climbed up on the socioeconomic ladder and became tenant cotton farmers. A tenant farmer usually owned the small amount of farming equipment required and furnished all the labor. O.C. had somehow managed to borrow enough money to purchase the equipment from a family living in Odell on Red River north of Vernon and got approval from the landowner that lived in Vernon to live on and farm her 100 acres. By September of 1947, I decided to go back to school, finishing the 11th and 12th grades in 1949. At age 19, I was nearly as old as some of the teachers. The Odell School was located in a cotton-producing area, so in the fall it would discontinue school at two each afternoon to allow the kids to hand harvest the crop. Most city dwellers think they are trendsetters, but the farm folk set a lot of trends. Rosie the Riveter, during World War II, gets the credit for liberating women from household chores. Farm women were liberated long before that. My mother and sisters went to the field when we did, particularly hoeing and gathering cotton. They did their cooking and cleaning on their own time. Looking back, I could have chosen several careers. I guess my music career was the shortest. Mrs. Griffin, third grade teacher at Talia, was for some reason teaching us do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do when she thought some of us were acting up. She explained that when we got back from lunch, I was to remind her to spank my hand. 
my memory was not as good then as now. The only other encounter I had with music was a harmonica with easy instructions I ordered when in high school. I still have them both and used very little. Mrs. Griffin got rid of me a short time later as we moved to Haskell County near the Brazos River, southwest of Knox City. The two-teacher Hutto School taught grades 1 through 4 by Mrs. White and 5 through 7 by her husband. My grades and discipline improved considerably while finishing the third and part of the fourth grades before moving back to Talia. In the fifth grade, I was progressing so well that they skipped me a grade, and so did everyone else in the state. This was about 1940, and the state went from 11 years of public education to a requirement of 12. When I finished high school in 1949, I spent the next year working for a neighboring farmer. Girls during that period had very little flexibility. If they did not continue their education, they moved the 15 miles to Vernon to work as telephone operators, clothing assemblers, or maybe store clerks. Some of my scissors moved to Vernon the next day after graduation. A few months prior to my entry into the armed forces in February 1950, two of my high school friends and I worked at Fort Hood. As most government work, the pay was good, hours short, and the work easy. This and my time in the armed forces was my first experience with government waste. However, you might say I was a war hero. With the fighting occurring in Korea, I spent the first 18 months in the U.S. and the last six on a boat trip to and in Germany. During my two years in the armed forces, farmers began harvesting cotton mechanically, thus making me obsolete. Three weeks after completing my military duties, I went to work for Encore in Eastland at $225 per month. My U.S. military benefits included 36 months of college tuition, books, and $110 per month living expenses. September 1953 showed me enrolled in night school at Ranger Junior College, thus increasing my income nearly 50%. After finishing Ranger Junior, Encore transferred me to Wichita Falls, where I received my teaching certificate. After two years of teaching at the Hearst Euless Bedford Schools and at the ripe old age of 28, HEB offered me the job of Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance, making me the youngest in Texas for a sizable school district. During my early years at HEB, a Joy Wilkerson left DeLeon and came to Fort Worth to work. She saw me and kept pestering until we got married a short time later, October 2nd, 1959. I never did understand if she had been shorted on an education in DeLeon or had vision problems. We took our firstborn Christy home from the Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth about noon in July of 1960 in a car without air conditioning. Joy could only say, isn't she pretty? Christy probably still does not know she was purchased on the installment plan, a total of $215. Our school insurance did not have maternity benefits, so we made monthly payments prior to her arrival. I do not recall whether the hospital or the doctor got the $115 and the other the $100. Fifteen months later, Brad arrived at the North Richland Hill Hospital. By then, we had maternity insurance, so I do not recall how much he cost. The hospital was close to our house, and it was October, so the trip was not as vivid as the one with Christy. I am sure his mother said, isn't he pretty? I still question her vision. Four years later, Darla came on the scene in North Richland Hills Hospital also. Health costs had increased considerably, but by then, we still had maternity coverage. By the time Darla arrived, we had decided three were enough. We were all relatively healthy, which is the number one priority in life, and none of us minded working, so we prospered. One of the advantages to being poor is economically. You can't go anywhere but up. With three successful kids and six grandkids starting their careers, who could want more? Even though money was scarce, we managed to travel and see a lot of historical things in the U.S. while they were at home. To give some examples of costs in the 1960s and early 1970s before gas prices and inflation hit the hardest in 1973, you could buy gasoline for around 20 cents per gallon. Large loaves of Mrs. Bear's bread were 29 cents. Off-brand 12-ounce canned soft drinks were 5 cents. And the drive-in movie was $1 per car load. These prices rose rapidly in 1973 and never came down. Boredom overtook me in 1973, so after 15 years in the same job, Joy and I, with our three children, left HEB for Comanche County to farm land that we had purchased. 
The economy faltered shortly after we moved. Joy got her teaching significant and taught in Dublin for 22 years. I worked part-time in Stephenville for six years. We managed the challenge and came out happy and healthy. With nearly continuous inflation after World War II until the present, land became a good investment. We also enjoyed the pride of ownership. Our first purchase in 1962 was 80 acres north of Dublin. We financed it through the Texas Veterans Land Board, low down, low interest rates, and 40 years of payments. We bought two more tracks from individuals with low down payments that joined this one. After clearing and making improvements to them, they were sold and land near Proctor Lake that was more productive was our home for the next 25 years. We bought and sold several places through the years, but the biggest mistake we made was a 425 acre tract acquired in 1998. We kept, and kept it and made improvements for over t the two years that qualified it for the capital gains tax on the profits. After we sold it in 2001 for $320,000, land prices skyrocketed, and by 2006 it would have sold for upwards of a million dollars. The easiest me money we made was a thousand acres we owned on the high plains of Texas. The federal government paid us to grow grass for soil conservation and wildlife habitat. We were only required to mow it for weed control. We sold the last of this on, in 2009, and currently our real estate consists of a house and 1.4 acres. If you have read all this rambling, you can see immediately which of our re relatives were makers and which were shakers. In closing, the old maker gave us two ends, one to sit on and one to think with. Success or failure in life depends on which one you use the decisions you make, and the efforts you make to succeed. Some sweat and a lot of luck.